Welcome to Free Life Chapel, where we help you discover and live the free life in Christ. My name is Angie. We're so excited that you decided to tune in with us today. Feel free to check out our website, freelifechapel.org, to find out more about who we are, what we do, and how you can be a part of it. If you ever find yourself in the Central Florida area, come visit us. Free Life Chapel would love to connect with you. But until then, we have an awesome message in store for you. Check it out. 52 is a, is, 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 the concept is this. In case you didn't know it, there are 52 weeks in a year. You, you all knew that, right? And the idea behind that is we don't take a Sunday off from being the church. How many know there's no pause button on leadership? How many know you're, you're leading when you're on vacation? you got to be careful. Just when you think you're away from home and you can do something different... Cindy and I took a cruise to the Bahamas one time. We thought, whoo, finally. And, and, and it just, it's just good to get away, just change the atmosphere. But we're walking down the streets in the Bahamas, and we hear, Pastor Scott, Pastor Sandy. <laughs> yeah, man. I get like, what the way? It's like, are you kidding me? Cindy, put your cigarette out. And so, like, wait, no, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm playing. I'm playing. Stop it. We don't have pause buttons in this. And I want to remind you something, and this is what we're hitting. I'm just laying the foundation. I want, to, I want us to understand the church is not a building. The church is a people. You are the church of Jesus Christ. Oh, look at somebody and tell them, I am that church. I am. To, I, you and I, we are the church of Jesus Christ. And here's what I've got good news for. We don't have to decide what church means, God's word defines it for us. God tells us this is the target. Stop painting targets around your arrows and start shooting arrows at my target. In other words, stop making it what you want it to be and start making it what I intended it to be. See, the frustration is when I try to go after God the way I want, not his design, and I don't get what I want out of it, I get mad and think God failed. But the truth is, God never promised this. He promised this. Do it my way, get my results. And that's what we're looking at when it comes to the church. Week number one, we talked about the declaration we make around here. I'm, I'm eternally loved. I am totally accepted. I am fully forgiven and abundantly blessed. How many of you, that, that phrase has haunted you for like a few years? Like it, it kind of runs in the background of your head, right? I know. That, that's our declaration, but those words, those words matter. Everyone can be loved, accepted, and then thankfully we can be forgiven and blessed. And then Cindy last week talked about creating an atmosphere of change. The values that this church runs by are not cute. They're, they're not just something on a website. These are iconic but biblical, God-centered, God-founded, rooted words that when they're enacted, it changes an atmosphere. And this house has to be, have a culture. It has to have an atmosphere that is God-honoring, God-loving, people-loving, that when they walk in, they don't run into free life. They run into Jesus when they walk in the place. Free Life Chapel can't change anybody's life, but Jesus is the game changer in everybody's life, right? That's what we have to set up. God's word lays it out. That's the menu of the house. Today, I want to just simply talk about a topic. I would just put it this way. Everyone belongs at the table. Someone shout, everyone. Everyone. Every, every, see, some of y'all on the balcony didn't do nothing. I have asked you three times, and y'all just looking at me. Everybody shout, everyone. Everyone belongs to the table. <coughs> Romans chapter 15. Romans 15, verse 7. If you're looking for a good tat, this is a good one right here. I highly recommend this one. Romans chapter 15, verse 7. We're going to read it loud. We're going to read it proud. I want, to, I want you to get this one verse in your heart. Here we go. One, two, three. Accept each other so that God will be given the glory. Accept each other the way you've been accepted. You ever, you ever hit times that you knew if people really knew me, they wouldn't accept me? Oh, yeah, you won't say amen right there, but that's okay. He said, accept each other the way Jesus said. Don't treat other people the way other people treated you. Treat other people the way Jesus treated you. 
that means I got to treat some folks nicer than what they treated me. Because Jesus leveraged it all for me, and he says, now that, that you, between you and me, that's what I want you to give away. Stop reacting and reflecting people and start reacting and reflecting me. Don't Just because they got an attitude when you checked out and you bought your loaf of bread does not mean you got an attitude for the rest of the day. No, I'm here to put some Jesus all over your life right now. and I'm going to live and express myself that way. Watch this. Accept each other as Christ has accepted you so that. Okay, that phrase is powerful. So that God will be given the glory. In other words, it's not that you just go around being a nice guy, a nice girl. But the impact, the overflow of us acting and living our lives that way is it impacts people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is kingdomness. There is spiritual ramifications. You can ruin somebody's pity party in the most wonderful way. I came in to smile all over your gloomy day today. Yes, I did. And we walk with that joy. We walk with that hope so that people at work come around you like, what are you smoking? Because every day, every day you walking around here with a smile on your face. Like you got it all together. What is it? Got? When you've got something deeper than just superficial, super, super, uh, uh, the, the, the circumstances of life, you've got something here that's a game changer. And ladies and gentlemen, People are hungry, starving for the hope that's inside of you. The word says, accept each other as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given the glory. Notice something. Drop the scorecards. Well, I'm going to treat them the way they treat me. Well, you're going to be a sorry person the rest of your life. I don't let people decide my attitude. I don't let people decide how I respond. I'm going to walk in and smile at you whether I know you or not. Live my life that way. I don't have any preconditions whether I'm going to live my life joyful, bold, strong, serving Christ. You don't have to go through an application process to come to Free Life Chapel to see if you fit into our car. Are you kidding me? Look around. Obviously, there's no application process. Everybody's welcome in the house. This is who we are. This is what we do. But watch this. Accept each other as Christ accepted you. The original word in, in the original language would be Greek, but, but it, it, it's the word receive, not accept. It, it, this is a, a translation. Receive, and the word receive here, it means give access to your heart. This doesn't mean just be nice to people and then blow them off. It doesn't mean just give them a high five and walk away. The Bible says give access to your heart. When the stranger walks in, love them like that because he gave access to his heart to you. You give access to your heart to people that you don't know yet. And when you do, the glory of God will touch and change their lives. He says, I don't want anything surface in my house. I don't want anything that's just fake, phony. You turn it on for an hour and turn it back off when you leave. I want you to live your life. Well, if, if I live my life like that, man, people could, people could hurt me. Yeah, they sure can. You're not loving properly if you're not vulnerable to being hurt. It's when people can hurt you that you've actually exposed yourself. That people can, I'm not saying we walk around like a doormat. Absolutely not. But let me tell you what we do. We are extending the love. Bible says, before we were even Christ followers, Jesus died for us. While we were still in our sin, he extended the vulnerability of I'm going to love you before you love me. And ladies and gentlemen, the church of Jesus Christ, 52 Sundays a year, is called to love people right where they are when they walk in the door. I got you. I'm not after you. I don't want anything from you. I'm here to serve you, to help you. What do you need from me? That's what the church is here for. How do you know that kind of attitude in an auditorium? It will change lives right there. That, that's a game changer. Yes. Where else do we go to find that? God forbid that Disney has a better culture than the church. I, I, I love Publix, but God forbid that they're nicer at Publix than they are at the church. I want the church to be that place where folks are sucked in and welcomed and encouraged and loved. And we don't care where you've been. We don't care what your past is. We don't care about the scorecard that others have kept. We'll tear that thing up and we believe in the next step of your life and the future that Jesus has planned for you. And if he changed me, he can change you. Let's go. Let's go.
We get excited about where people are headed, not where they've been. So that we start living out of expectation and not just experience. That changes everything. Uh, church people, we're different. We different. Yeah, we, we, we respond different. I, 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 see this, I see this response modeled in the opening story that I told in, in the beginning of this series of the woman with the alabaster box. Y'all remember the story? Well, if you don't, I'm going to tell you again. Uh, the, the, the Bible gives us an account of Jesus is invited to a dinner, and he gets there, and, and while he's with the, 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 the host of the dinner, uh, and, and, and the disciples, there's a, a lady that enters the room and, 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 and out, of, out of just love and gratitude and worship, she breaks open an alabaster box, which was a perfume bottle equal to about one year's salary. And she then, she broke it open. She didn't just unscrew it. it she broke it and she poured it all on Jesus as worship, and honoring and sacrifice to him. There was no price too valuable. And she honored him, and when she did that, it upset some people around the, the disciples, and Jesus pushed back on them, said, get out of my face. Like this lady, what she's done is beautiful, and we're going to talk about her for forever and a day. It's a, it's a powerful story, and, and we, we talked about that in week number one, and, and it kind of flowed through, but, but here's what's interesting. There's actually two stories of a woman with an alabaster box in your Bible. There, there, there's two different stories. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and John all repeat the same story. Luke had to be the standout. He has his own version, but not just his own version, a whole separate story, but it's so identical. It's like, are you sure we're not talking about the same story? Completely different. And I want to show you something inside here because Matthew, Mark, and John, their story is taking place, according to the Bible, just outside of Jerusalem, a little town called Bethany. And at that dinner, there's a guy named Simon the leper who invites Jesus to dinner. Jesus goes, and the woman who opens the alabaster box and pours it on him, her name is Mary. That's actually, she, that, that was, she was Lazarus' sister. But, but the book of Luke, and this is really important, the book of Luke, he starts talking about a story of a woman. There's a dinner going on, and a man named Simon, not the leper, Simon the Pharisee. And this story is taking place in Galilee, which is, which is miles and miles and miles apart. They're two completely different regions of Israel, so it's not like you got them mixed up. This is not the same story. Simon the Pharisee will say, well, but they got the same name. How many of y'all in the room got, got the same name, Bob? Any are there any guy, two people named Bob? Well, look at that. We got Bob. There. Hey, how about Joe? We got Joe in the room. How about Shaniqua? We got Shaniqua in the room. We got the, how pa Pablo? Where's Pablo? We got Pablo. We got everybody. We got, we got two guys, same names. Luke is Simon the Pharisee, and then the Bible just says, doesn't give her name, it just says a sinner woman. So watch this. There's four different main characters that are identified in this identical story. And here it is. Simon the leper, Mary, Simon the Pharisee, and the sinner woman. Y'all see what I'm talking about? Yep. Two stories. But these four characters are the standout, and these stories are identical in order to tie them together and give us a story behind the story. I just saw this two weeks ago for the first time in my life. I got so excited, and I'm going to tell you all about it. <laughs> Jesus goes, and he meets with all four of these people, two separate settings. These are not parables. These are stories that are taking place. Two different regions of Israel completely, not in the same city. So it's not the retelling of the same story. These are completely different. And Jesus chose to meet with all of them, and it shows Jesus' heart for people. Check this out. The first one we find out is Simon the leper. Simon the leper. Well, let me just help you with just something up front right there. In Jesus' day, you do not go to a leper's house to eat. No, that, that, that would not be wisdom. A, the, a leper was an outcast. A, if, you, if you had contracted leprosy, you had a disease that was so contagious, and you had to leave town. You left family. You were isolated. You were alone. You were gone. But the Bible says that Jesus goes to Simon the leper's house, which tells me this. More than likely, Jesus had healed Simon, but he had been a leper so long, the label still stuck. 
It's amazing how you can be healed and mislabeled at the same time. Isn't it, isn't it, hey, aren't you glad for what God brought you out of? But it's a, it, it, it's a yeah, 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 thank God for that. But ain't it amazing how people still want to call you who you used to be as opposed to who you are right now? And if you're not careful, we will start struggling. I'm saved, but I'm still struggling with where I've been and what happened there. And I so identify with my past, it's hard to get into my future. And we see Simon here. The disease was gone, but the label remained. When I was flying back from Colorado yesterday, I had this case that, 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 that was with me uh, carrying some stuff. And, and, and as, as, I was, as I was coming back, I, I got to the airport, and it still had the tag from the former flight on it. And I had to remove the old tag so they could put a new tag on it to make sure that it actually made it home. Because if you're not careful, you can have something valuable with you, but if it's labeled to the wrong destination, it will never get into your future. It will stay in your past. And you have to understand your identity, who you are, where you're going is not in your past. It's in your future. you got to get labels off your life. you got to get people who can see where you're headed, not where you've been. you got to get people who don't remind you of your failure, but remind you of the promises of God in your life that you're going to make it. And I know it sucked yesterday, but your best days are still ahead of you. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. I need people who believe in me. You need people who believe in you. Simon the leper, Jesus said, look, I'm hanging with you. I know you, you've been through some things. You've, you've been forgiven, but you're still battling shame. You're healed, but you're fighting that past reputation. You still hear the words of what your dad said in your head. You can't shake that. It's like a splinter in your soul. He says, I want you to bring all your wrong labels to me. Bring the wrong labels to Jesus so he can rip the wrong destination off your life. It's time for the anger to go. It's time for the hard heart to go. It's time for the failure and the mess to come off your life. You're not a reject. You're accepted. You're loved because those labels will become identity. And I want you to understand something. Jesus says, I will have dinner with people who are mislabeled because I'm the only one who can re-identify your life. He has no problem having dinner with mislabeled people. And then he, Mary, was at the dinner. Mary was there with Simon the leper. And as I told you, Mary was Lazarus' brother. Y'all remember Laz? That dude got up. He was dead and got up. Y'all act like you got it all together. Look, that don't even excite anybody because you heard it so much. Yeah, a dead guy got up. Did you hear what I just said? A dead guy got up. You kidding me? Jesus spoke. He's wrapped like a mummy, you know. You don't walk out. You got to hop out of that grave. How many of that would just freak y'all out? You would have a hard time going to sleep. I mean, I'm, I'm happy for the miracle, but Jesus, that's kind of freaking me out right now. Can you do something different with that? Mary was there, but watch this. But before, before Lazarus died, he was just sick. And, 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 and Jesus knew Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, Mary's sister, and like their family, like they're, like they're close, they're close. And Jesus hears Lazarus is sick, and the Bible says he waited for four days. <laughs> waited until the sickness quit and the death kicked in. And when Jesus comes walking on the scene, he's already buried. He's already in the ground. He comes walking up, and Mary goes, mm, Jesus, I need to talk to you. She called Jesus up, and she, she gave Jesus a what for? If you would have been here, where were you when I needed you? I thought I could trust you. I thought you were my friend. I thought you cared for the situations in my life. I prayed, and you didn't heal. They died. I prayed. I didn't get the job. Where were you? It was something I was supposed to have. I can't believe I lost my baby, where were you, Jesus? Do you care or do you not? She hit Jesus hard with some questions. I've been there. Cindy and I, many of you know, we have a son and a daughter in heaven today. Isaiah and Gabrielle. Two, two, two separate pregnancies that Cindy went through, and they were, they were difficult and horrible on all those levels. And, and I had some conversations with God 
I'm trying to raise more another young man later on, a young lady that's going to honor and serve you, declare your gospel, preach, worship you, rep you to the world. Are you kidding? I'm trying to raise another generation of Christ follower, and my children die. Where are you? Oh, you see, if you can't talk real with God, then you need, to, you need to put that relationship aside and go get another real relationship that you can talk to Jesus. Have you all ever asked Jesus a question before because you didn't understand? I, I, I don't get the situation right now. Jesus didn't do what I expected. Jesus didn't do what Mary expected. You should have healed. You should have stopped it. You should have fixed it. You should have got it. I, all of these things, where, where were you? But see, Mary is also known as a consummate worshiper. She was, she was always at Jesus' feet worshiping. In fact, she got on everyone else's nerves because she was worshiping. And here's what Jesus says. I'll spend time with people who are upset and disappointed with what I've done or not done in their life because I need to make sure that the worshipers stay close enough to me that they can be in my presence because if not, the questions will eat them alive. And you got to get back to my presence to see my smile, to feel my presence, to know I love you. And in spite of the hurt and the pain, I want to remind you I'm good and I'm here. And I can turn any situation around and make it work for your good. Everything is going to be all right. He says, I need to keep you close. In other words, Jesus says, I'll have dinner with Mary because I need to get disappointed worshipers to the table. But then there's this, this other guy, this Simon the Pharisee. Oh, that just sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Simon the Pharisee. Simon, Pharisees were religious experts. These were the guys who, like, they had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy memorized by the time they were 13. we got to upgrade our kids' church. we got to really work on this. Yeah. They, like by the time they're 13, like they, they, got it, they got the whole thing memorized, y'all, memorized. This is who Simon was. He invites Jesus to dinner. This is Luke's account. This is going on in the Galilee region. That's the northern part of Israel. And, and he's there and he's, he invites Jesus to dinner. But he invites Jesus to dinner not because he loved him. He invited Jesus out of his skepticism. Like, okay, I've seen that he heals and he's a really good teacher. I wonder if he really is a prophet. And Simon invited Jesus not because he loved him, but he was trying to catch some dirt on Jesus. Y'all ever had the people that they invited you to some things and you wasn't sure what the motive was behind why they invited you? Jesus knew the motive and walked smack up in the place anyway. I, I, I love this reality right here. He, he, he wasn't sure who Jesus was and he's got all this thing set up trying to catch Jesus in something, but Jesus... Jesus welcomed Simon's doubts. You don't think I'm who I say I am? Let's have dinner. I'm not worried about what you're going to hear me say, what you're going to see me do. Just come a little closer. Let's, let's you and I talk. Jesus didn't push him away, walk away, stiff harm him, put him down for you religious devil. You. He, he didn't come at him that way. You know why? Even doubters belong at the table. Even people who are not sure. There's, there's, there's folks in this room today. You're not sure if this whole Jesus thing is real. I'm not mad at you. I, I'm, I'm so glad you are. We've had people attend Free Life Chapel for three months, four months, shopping Jesus. I see it. It looks good. It sounds good. I just want to make sure it's real. I, I have a respect for skeptics. Because sometimes they're just not all in. I'm just, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to work it out. But I want you to understand something about Jesus is you never learn about Jesus. Jesus is revealed to you. There is something that hits your heart that becomes so undeniable. I can't get him off of me, but you hang out at dinner with him long enough, Jesus is going to get all over your life. And it's the absolute best thing that ever happened. We, we've had people that have attended here that were, that were confessing atheists. How many of you know they don't really belong in a church? Because what are you doing here if you don't believe there is? And we're talking about him and singing to him and reading scriptures about him. And this one atheist, she told me, she attended for months. She said, I just, I don't believe, but I just feel better here. I said, we'll take that. 
she hung out too long. And Jesus crawled right up inside of her heart, her world, and she gave her life to Jesus because he was revealed to her. Yeah. Why is that? Because there's an atmosphere. We're not judging you when you walk in the door. You're welcome. Bring your questions. Jesus is not afraid to have dinner with people who are skeptics because where else will the skeptic ask questions, get answers, settle their fears? Where, where do they go unless they're welcome and they're loved when they walk in here? I've got good news for every skeptic in the room. You can belong here before you believe here. You don't have to align with us in order to fit in with us because the truth is all of us still struggle in some area of believing in our lives if you've never come to the point that you really question is there really a God then you really haven't tested your faith yet mm, welcome to free life chapel this is raw and real the fourth one and I'm done with this one the fourth, the fourth person here is the sinner woman that's what the Bible calls her I'm not, I'm not busting on her she was just someone who had not known Christ. She had a nasty reputation in the city, long time. She was scorned, outcast. She was, she was disregarded. But she's the one that came in the room grateful and honoring to Jesus. While Jesus was sitting beside the religious guy who knew better, the one who came in, and she just wrecked the entire room because she was so grateful she didn't care about her reputation. She didn't care what they said about her. I love him more than your opinion about me. I want more of him and less. And she just emptied herself. You see, the custom of the day was when a, someone came to your house, number one, you wash their feet because they walk in barefooted in stuff. That just makes sense. That's not a holy moment. But foot washing when we were in the church. So I wish someone would tell, if you walk in barefooted, then wash your feet. But if you guys using your feet, ain't no need for foot washing up inside of here. I'm just saying, that's in Jesus' day, you, went, you had a foot washing every time you went to someone's house because you got some nasty feet right now. And then when you come in, it was custom, you greet people with a kiss when you come in. It's honoring. I mean, like, dudes kissing dudes. Like, like we're going, I'm going to kiss you on the jaw right now. And you, you kiss and you welcome people. And then most of the time, you gave them some kind of scented olive oil to put in their hair because it didn't smell the best out there. And it just helped the aroma, the fragrance, because if they've been traveling for a long time on the back of a, then all of a sudden, now, we need to freshen the place up. So they did some things to kind of help. This was custom. Wash the feet, greet with a kiss, and scent, scented oil for the hair. She comes in. Simon, the Pharisee, didn't do any of this for Jesus. Didn't wash his feet. Didn't greet him to honor him. Didn't do anything to anoint his hair. And the woman, the sinner woman, the one that everybody mocked and laughed at, she comes busting in the room. And how did she wash his feet? With her tears. She was so grateful. She's crying. She washed her, his feet with her tears. And she begins to wipe then his feet with her hair. She's kissing his feet. The greeting of the kiss that Simon didn't give, she was kissing his feet. Not, not his face. Kissing his feet and then the scented oil yep yeah, she broke her alabaster box and she poured everything she had on Jesus's feet and then she's wiping his feet cleaning him off but here's what's amazing when you have worshipped God to the degree that you've emptied yourself what's amazing is when you leave that room you smell just like Jesus because the same thing that was on him was all over her. And she's walking through the streets and go, dang, girl, you smell good. You think I smell good? There's one that changed my life, and we smell just alike. Because when you hang with Jesus, it doesn't matter what the rep was. When you've worshipped him with your heart, and you're just grateful, you're just so thankful that there's not a scorecard being kept against you, but he accepts you and loves you just as you are. I just want to smell like Jesus. I want to look like Jesus. I want to rep Jesus everywhere I go. And she did. There, there's these four people here. These four people. Jesus had dinner with them. The church, this is a picture of the church, of who we're supposed to have in the room, having dinner with them. The mislabeled people, get under the table so we can get the new destination on their life. The disappointed worshiper, get them to the table so we can see their hearts healed. That whether the skeptic and the doubter, get them to the table because there's answers that will bring peace to their heart. 
The, for the, 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 the sinner, the one that's far from Christ, the one that's been a train wreck in life, get him to the table because a life of radical gratitude is going to whip and change everything about their future. Jesus, Jesus said, I'm all about them. I'll have dinner with them. Free Life Chapel. This is who your constituency should look like. Mislabeled, disappointed, skeptics, worshipers who have a nasty, sullied past. You're all welcome to the table. In fact, Free Life Chapel is filled with a bunch of busted, broken people who have found their way to the table of Jesus. And you may not be aware, so I think I'll help you. In fact, Mr. Davis, if you would please join me on the platform, would you please introduce our guests for us today that are with us at Free Life Chapel? Yes, I will, Pastor. This resilient individual once grappled with the suffocating grip of depression brought on by profound isolation and hunting specter of suicidal thoughts. But today, fear and anxiety have given way to a new life of hope and belonging. Please welcome to the table, Victoria Locke. <laughs> Up next, Meet an individual who once was overcome with low self-worth and emotional distress, navigating the challenges that accompany single parenthood. Today, she stands secure in her ability to provide for her family and firmly believes her true worth comes through her faith in Jesus Christ. Welcome to the table, Camille Richards. Up next, here's a gentleman whose life was once deeply entangled in the world of gangs for many years, fully immersed in the lifestyle. However, today is a devoted member of Free Life Chapel, cultivating a deep love for people and demonstrating the testament power of faith and redemption. Welcome to the table, Sean Campbell. Up next, allow me to introduce a man who once struggled with the shadows of his past and the haunting stigma of incarceration at Polk Correctional Institute. Today, with unwavering determination, he continues to pursue a deeper relationship with God alongside his loving and acceptable friendships at Free Life Chapel. Welcome to the table, Joe Allen. Up next, let me introduce someone who found herself amidst the challenging journey of a divorce while practicing Santeria. Her story takes a remarkable turn, mending her marriage of now 16 years and embodying the transformative power of her faith in Jesus Christ. Welcome to the table, Yanel Jacome. Up next, introducing a remarkable man who has endured the profound pain of burying his beloved brother. And alongside his wife, experiencing the heart-wrenching loss of their first child due to miscarriage. Despite the weight of these tragedies, he chose to trust God in this darkest hour. Now, he and his beautiful wife are preparing to welcome their baby boy into this world. Please welcome to the table, Kyler Porter. Yeah. 
And finally, meet an extraordinary man whose life defied all odds. Faced with a devastating stage four testicular cancer diagnosis and given a few months to live, now remarkably stands cancer free, defying his projective lifespan and had three more children after the doctor said it would be impossible. Welcome to the table, Mark Lever. Ladies and gentlemen, did you hear who's at the table? People who have been broken, hurt, messed up, a past they don't want to look back to, but you look at these faces today, you would wonder if they've ever been through anything in their entire life. What is it that brings a change like that? That's not a vacation. That's not a good weekend. That's not a great job. That is the love and the transformation of Jesus Christ. When you just come after him, I just want to have dinner with him. It's just dinner. But when I sat down at the table, he began to heal my heart. He began to put my mind back together. He gave me answers where I was missing. He made everything make sense. He's making it all work together for my good and they sit here today whole and healed by the love of Jesus Christ if you're not yet please stand to your feet and I want you to put your hands together and give Jesus a hand clap of praise because he still heals and restores mislabeled you're welcome disappointed in God get to the table yeah skeptical not sure you can be long we're so glad you're here messy life you belong at the table if we didn't have our struggles we wouldn't need the table it's your mess that qualifies you to sit at the table. I don't arrive to the table put together. I arrive to the table a mess. And when I sit down at Jesus' table, he feeds and heals and begins to put it all back together. And I look a whole lot better than I actually was. If you saw me before Jesus, if you saw me two years ago, if you saw me six months ago, if you saw me then... You would never believe that I am where I am right now. And that would be the testimony of every one of these men and women standing up here right now. I want to pray for you today. This is the church. This is me. There's no superstars up here. The only one that we're here to worship, his name is Jesus. And I need him like they need him, like you need him. I want us to pray in this room today. And I don't know where you are, if you, which of these stories you can relate with, or you got one to say, Pastor, you wouldn't believe it. Oh, I promise you, I can put another chair at this table right now. There's always room for another one. I want you to bow your heads all through this room. If you're here today and you say, Scott, I don't know Jesus that way. Or maybe I've been broken and hurt and dropped by people and I pushed him away and I've never asked Jesus into my life but today I, I need to get to the table maybe you've been attending for several months and you just kind of been shopping and not sure but today you say you know what I belong there if he would accept Simon the Pharisee then he will accept me if he'll accept skeptics and doubters then maybe I can belong and believe if you're in this room today and you say, Scott, that's me. I need to give my life to Jesus on the count of three, on the count of three, on the count of three. No hesitation, no wait, no delay. I want you to take that step. I want you to push. It's going to be between you and God, but I want you to throw that hand in the air identifying, I need Jesus in my life today. They're going to bring the lights up so I can see. I want to be able to identify with you, but on the count of three, I want you to bring it ready. One, two, three. Right now, where are you? Hold that hand up. Hold that hand up. Hold that. Hand. Oh my goodness. Yeah, hold that right there. Right there. Eyes closed. Eyes closed. All through the place. Just keep that hand right there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 36, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 4, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 44, 1, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 54, 52, 53, 54, 55, 6, 57, 58, 59, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71. Put those hands down. Most important, Jesus saw that hand. Oh, I'm about to open the table up for you and bring you to the head of the table because Jesus has a spot for you. Everyone pray this. Jesus, come into my life. I'm coming to the table. I'm bringing all my questions. I'm bringing my fears, my disappointment, my past, everything. I need you. Get the labels off my life. Forgive me, change me, heal me, show me your plan for my life. Take all of me. I take all of you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, Free Life Chapel. We hope this message encouraged you. For more encouraging messages, check out our website, freelifechapel.org. Until then, we hope to see you next time.